and and we're live wonderful um good afternoon everyone and welcome to the admissions panel which is a live stream hosted by myself alfie the outreach and admissions officer and i'm joined by sos and lynn who are two wonderful tutors here and jennifer and meg who are two wonderful undergraduates here um, so quickly, just to give an overview of this session, Lynn is going to run us quickly through the major dates uh, in the application process that are coming up and how those bits work. We'll then uh, um, hear from both Sos and Lynn on their, what they, what they as, as admissions tutors look for and what they're trying to do. And then we'll hear from uh, Jennifer, Meg, and Iris, who's just joined us, hi Iris, um, on how they feel about the various parts um, of the application process and how, as, as undergraduates, they, they might give you tips on going through them yourselves. So I will hand over to Lynn. Um, take it away, Lynn. Thank you, Alfie. And yeah, welcome everybody to the session. Um, great to see you virtually and I'm looking forward to your questions. Um, I'm just going to very briefly run through the kind of the dates that you need to bear in mind. I'm sure you know these already, but they bear repeating. Um, so the very first one that you have to think about is the date by which your application has to be in. Um, and that date is the 15th of October. Um, please make sure that you hit that date and make sure that your UCAS form is submitted as well. Um, the next date that you have to think about is to uh, make sure that you have registered for the English Literature Admissions Test, the ELAT. Registration for that is already open um, and uh, that opened on the 1st of September. Now, if you know that you're going to need a modified paper for the ELAT, so perhaps you need larger print, for example, um, you have to have registered for the ELAT, uh, that modified paper by the 30th of September. So please do bear that in mind. It, that, that deadline is coming up quite quickly. Um, otherwise, again, it's the 15th of October. You have to have registered for the ELAT by the date that you also put in your application for Oxford. So that's actually quite easy. It's the same day. So just make sure that, that you hit that date. Um, the, the next date will be the, the deadline for the submission of your written work. And that is the um, 11th of November. Uh, you will be hearing about that. You will be reminded about these dates, but it's just a good idea to have them down either on your calendars or if like me, you still use a paper diary because that's the best way you cope with things, then put it in your diary. Um, and then after that, you've, you've put everything in that you need to do. Um, you sit the ELAT on the 4th of November. Um, everybody sits it on the same day. Uh, it doesn't matter where in the world you are, that's the date that you sit it. So again, make sure that you have that date firmly down so that you know when that happens. After you've put in your application form, sat the ELAT, sent in your written work, you just sit back then and wait. <laughs> and the next um, dates to have in your mind are the dates of the interviews. If you are shortlisted and called for interview, though interviews this year are going to be all online again as they were last year. Um, the interview weeks that you need to be thinking about making space and time for those are the week beginning the 6th of December, which is when our first round of interviews will happen that week on uh, between Monday and Wednesday, slightly later in the week if you're applying for a joint school, but Monday and Wednesday if you're just applying for English. And then the following week, the week beginning December the 13th, um, and that is our second round of interviews. You won't know whether you're going to be called to the second round of interviews until the end of the previous week. So don't panic if you, you don't get any dates immediately for that second week. You should again, you wait and you, you will hear. So those are the main dates. Um, and then you will hear about your application, whether you've been successful or not, in January, at the beginning of January. So don't worry, you won't hear immediately. You have to wait till after Christmas. So those are the main dates for you. Brilliant, thanks Lynn. Yes, okay. um, I think now it will probably be a good idea to go through those kind of chunks along the way of application and get a sense of, as tutors, what you and SOS look for and what you 
yeah, what not necessarily what you'd recommend, because we get a lot of questions about oh, what makes a, a killer personal statement. I don't think there is such a thing because it's a personal statement, it's about what you are interested in want to write about. But yeah, kind of an indication of what you'd like to see along the way. I'm letting Sauce go first, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, with a personal statement, I'd say probably top of the thing we're looking for is what you enjoy reading. Um, really importantly, what you read outside of your school studies. So the books, not that you're made to read, but the books that you've chosen to read and why you enjoy them, what interests you in, you in them. And that can connect with books that you studied in school. It could be plays you've gone to see. Sometimes they connect with films you've watched or television adaptations or, and it really, students often ask, you know, this sense of there are certain books they're meant to have read. It's not the case at all doesn't matter what it is. Um, people have incredible, some people read in a concentrated way in certain areas, others dot around. It can be a mixture of huge number of different genres or whatever. It's that you enjoy reading and are interested in reading. So that would be one of our top criteria that we're looking for in a personal statement is that sense of, a, of an individual enthusiasm. And, um, and the only proof that you enjoy reading um, and that you really are a reader is the reading you do. So tell us about that. Not a list, something about why you enjoy what you're in, what interests you in you, you in them, whether it's a range of stuff or very specific, you know, a different kind of taste. Give us a, a flavour of that. And my other top tip for personal statement would be before you send it, read it through out loud. And if it doesn't mm. sound like you, and if you can't actually say it without taking it, you know, in one breath, if it's a sentence with no commas in or whatever else, then rewrite it so you can say it. So it does sound like you. And that will get it nicely written and genuinely personal. Mm. Those would be I think that, my main advice. That's a really nice tip. I don't think I ever read mine aloud. I wonder how on earth it got through. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, Lynn, how, how, do you, how do you look at personal statements? What do you look for? Um, well, I, I look in exactly the same way as Soz, which is good to know. We're looking for the same things. Um, yes, obviously, it's about what you're reading, what you're thinking about what you're reading. You can't tell us everything that you read, because if you're applying for English, you probably read all the time. So therefore, telling us everything that you're reading um, isn't going to work and you haven't got enough room. So make some good choices. Sometimes I say to people, you know, tell us, give us a, a kind of how you've got somewhere. So you read something, then it took you to something else. And then that took you to something else. Mm. Um, uh, you know, why you made those choices. That can be a really good kind of snapshot of, of describing how you discover literature as well and what you're thinking about it. Don't worry about the extracurricular stuff. Um, it, it's not really going to make any difference to whether you're going to be called for interview or whether you're going to be uh, successful in your your application it's nice to it's good for us to know that you're a well-rounded individual and you've got interests outside of school and you're all doing you know really interesting things so keep it short keep it relevant um and don't worry about using up huge amounts of space and and that's not just some Oxford talking, um, that's actually pretty much all universities talking. <laughs> um, you know, it, it, English is not a, a vocational course. You don't have to prove, you know, say you were applying for medicine, you, you would need to show that you've engaged in some way with the practicalities of um, you know, working in a hospital or working in, in, in healthcare in some way. We don't need that from you for English. So don't, don't get anxious about that, that side of it. Yeah, certainly nobody demands that you've gone and done an internship with Penguin Books or, no. or anything like that. No, no, no. <laughs> if you have, amazing. And maybe yeah, I mentioned it. But yes. experience. Yeah. Um, but there is no, certainly no obligation to. We'd all like one of those. <laughs> that nobody gets one. Wouldn't so. we just? Wouldn't we just? Um, yeah. yeah, so, so I, I'm not going to ask any of the undergraduates to, to go back to and read out their personal statements because it's very hard writing about yourself. It makes you feel deeply just cringy just trying to sell yourself where well, it certainly does to me um but I, i'd be really interested to hear from from the three of you how you found the experience of writing it when, what kind of starting point did you have um jennifer i completely agree with what's been said about you're not trying to recite a list of prescribed books that you think will make you sound really intelligent i mean if you think about your ps like you're trying to 
builds an engaging structure and a compelling portrait of yourself. That's not going to be built out of, you know, generic standard issue building blocks. You're trying to show how you responded to works as much as what you read. Um, and I'm sad I can't claim credit for this story, but I know someone in my college above me who wrote about airport thrillers that she thought were really, really horrible and um, what those taught her about literature and the way she responds to works. And she got an interview because the teacher thought she was so compelling and original. So if there's something you really love that's really niche like that, then feel completely free to write about it. Fantastic. That's, yeah, quite the story, quite the story. Um, Meg, how did you approach writing your statement? Um, I think what I did was look at it like a thought pattern. So a bit, mm. I think it's been said before, like how one novel brought me to another novel or a podcast or sort of, I think everyone thinks you have to follow some canonical journey, but actually, even if it's like, um, you know, as I said, a podcast you've seen on Spotify or um, a newspaper clipping that was just like really interesting for you and sort of linked to some sort of argument, if you can wrap that all into this sort of fabric um, of one core theme or idea, um, I think that that can be really interesting. And I think one other main thing I'd say is just definitely read what you've put on your personal statement because um, a lot of people, I don't know, might put down something massive like Chaucer's Canterbury Tales because they think it sounds great. And then they've not read, they've read one tale and haven't read the rest. And then they're really stressed for like a month before because they're trying to whip through some epic. And um, I think you just make the whole process like worse for yourself if you don't follow what actually interests you. Because if you follow stuff that compels you, then you're you're likely to enjoy it. Mm. No, I, I I would completely concur with you on that. Um, Iris, how did you approach writing your statement? I think to be honest, the approach is probably the worst bit. When you're starting <laughs> off, you have to give a blank page and you kind of have all these rules. I remember that being really stressful, having the the character count and the line count and all yeah. of that which obviously fitting in anything into something so specific is gonna be hard. But um, when I'd started writing with a really cringy opening sentence, like I've always been curious or something awful. It was just like echoes in my head still, I hated it. But um, when you get into the, the main body of your thing, it is kind of, you want a general idea, maybe I like art. I'm, I try to kind of link things back to that side of myself and my interest in like fine art and how pure athletism kind of connected to poetry. I was looking at with Keats and back in earlier stuff and then, what I'd read that can collect some of those ideas. It was a bit, bit of a bit of a melange, I would say. A lot of things going on at once and trying to make connections between schoolwork and my independent work as well. Um, I think there's a little bit of chance to go slightly more in depth with some things. I mean, a little bit of analysis is really good to show that you can do it, I think. And also mm. making connections that you made outside of school. So I went to a lecture that then taught me this and then I read this and then a little journey I think step by step because that's I mean that's how you think and how you do access information so it makes sense and it's quite natural um and also shows you're curious and interested I think so if you've gone out of your way to do something that your school didn't tell you you know these like these things are compressive on a statement or these poems are really amazing you found them yourselves and what did you actually you find about them what did you gather from those those things that you read because that is personal and interesting um but yeah it, it's it's just a really hard thing to start so drafting and drafting and drafting it's just the only way to do it, I think. Um, yeah. Yeah, drafting, 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 that, that cursed word. Um, I just add, because I think Harris is absolutely right. I think everybody's got that sense that you're standing on a podium trying to sell yourself or, or present yourself. It's often easier starting it as a conversation. So mm. do it with a friend where you start by explaining why you want to study English. And they might be explaining why they want to study biology or something like that, but just a bit of open with that. What have you done so far that makes you want to do that? And what do you want to know more about that makes you want to do it? And if you mm. just start from there and it's part of conversation, it feels a little less weird, mm. um, but it's also fundamentally weird. I yeah, mean, yeah. there's a fundamental weirdness to the whole thing. So let's just embrace that. <laughs> yeah, it's it's gotta be done so jump on in um I, I think meg's advice about making sure that you put things you've actually read on your personal statement <laughs> is really important simply because uh when it comes to the interviews and i do this you know very often the your personal statement will be used as a jumping off point for the interview um and, and partly to allow you to settle down in the interview to give you a sense that you're going to start talking about something familiar um that you've already thought about before the interview moves perhaps into to different areas so you know don't put down something you intend to read because 
what will happen is you're you're coming to the interview and the first thing you'll be asked about is that book that you intended to read and you didn't <laughs> you can almost guarantee that that's what will happen didn't get around to it yeah. <laughs> didn't quite get around to doing that yeah so mm. so make sure that it is and so that goes back to this idea of don't think you know there has to be a certain books there that will impress us yes um actually that's that that kind of scenario is much less likely to happen if you really confine your statement to what you've enjoyed reading and what you actually have reading rather than thinking oh you know I must have read War and Peace or whatever it might be you know otherwise I I can't possibly be considered as somebody who likes literature don't go down that route no don't do it mm, <laughs> certainly and I, I think actually your, your example of War and Peace is is interesting because we've had a lot of a lot of questions on what does it mean studying English literature? Is it the literature of England? No, not at all. It's any literature written in the English language. So it could be you're talking about, I don't know, Jamaican authors or Indian authors, but also it's completely acceptable to talk about um, foreign literature authors that have been translated into English in your uh, personal statement. I, how does How does that look? to you as tutors when people do that what, what do you think I think I think that's great I think they've got a really wide interest in reading and they want to engage with different ideas about you know novels and plays and poetry and and I want to talk about that and I I, I make discoveries all the time when I'm reading personal statements and doing interviews, uh, find myself talking about such a wide range of things. And I, I usually, at the end of the interview week, will go, oh, I must read that, and I must read that. It sounded really interesting. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and same. And I often end up, having read lots and lots of personal statements, I often go off and try and read a whole load of the books before interview, exactly mm. because it seems like every... Last year, everybody was reading Circe by Madeleine Mir Miller. Okay. There was a kind of Circe event, so I rushed off and read Circe, ready for that. Um, so in that sense, it's, but really, really importantly, I've had so many candidates ask it about, you know, potential candidates ask, what, what's the book I should read? As though mm. it's like a kind of Masonic handshake. You know, there's this mm. secret thing, so long as you've read, I don't know, Middlemarch or, <laughs> or Little Dorrit or something like that, that's the secret book. <laughs> no such thing. It doesn't matter what it is. And in that sense, literature and English literature and translation, American literature, contemporary literature, old literature, just doesn't matter. Um, yeah. It's why you enjoy it, what you think about it, the kind of ideas it prompts, how you connect it to your other reading. Um, that's that simple. That's it. That's it, isn't it? Just brilliant. Thank you. Um, so as you were saying, Lynn, the next kind of big um, block with the application process is coming to the ELAT mm. and how how you approach that. We have plenty of advice on our website. If you go to the English faculty, the Oxford English faculty website, um, under undergraduate admissions, we have really good new resources to help you prepare for the ELAT. We have a walkthrough that's also available on our YouTube channel. Um, I would certainly recommend uh, watching that and learning and hearing the tips and the time structuring and everything that that includes. But as, as tutors, the, the ELAT is sent away, it's externally marked, it's returned to tutors, um, goes into the grading of the banding of candidates. But how do you guys look at it as a script of someone's answer, someone's exam answer? Um, Sars will, will come to you first. Thank you, Luke. Um, above all, it gives us a sense of how somebody writes under exam conditions. Um, so sometimes we get candidates who are really very, very nervous in interview, find it hard to respond and so on. And sometimes they have wonderfully articulate ELAT scripts. And we know that that's unlike the written work submitted where someone else could have had a hand in that. For the ELAT, we know that's that candidate's unaided work. And so to think about the ELAT, often candidates think about each bit of this, because we're talking about lots of different things they have to do, as though each bit you have to be like top of the field and incredibly amazing at every bit of it, you don't. Um, and think of the fact there are lots of different bits, so it are lots of different chances to show what you can do. Um, and sometimes people are much better in person and sometimes they're much better on paper. So mm. that's one thing we get from the ELAT, it's just a taste of how somebody can write a sense of their voice. Um, sometimes, I mean, especially this year when, School students have had that much less tuition than any other time. 
that much less time to spend on how they write and so on. Um, we'll be doing even more what we've tended to do, which is just often looking for flashes of something to say, well, this bit wasn't so interesting, the rest, but this, they were really thinking if they could say this, I really like this bit. And so it's not necessarily even, you know, being sort of performing across the board, it's something in there that makes us see how someone can think. So just to sort of reassure potential candidates that it, it's not a trick and it's not something where you could do everything. It's another chance to articulate your ideas, to respond to something. And I'd say probably one of the things that I value highly in it is genuinely close reading, really engaging with the language in the passage um, and a readiness to struggle with some of the bits that are difficult. Because we mm. nearly always, we tend to choose passages that have got something interesting or quirky or contradictory or something, you know, not stuff that anybody can get at first glance and it's sort of blandly obvious. Um, so a readiness to try and, you know, personally engage with some of the bit that's that's kind of chewy or hard or, or strange, um, rather than sort of stating the blandly obvious, which often, under, you know, in nervous conditions, you can kind of go to the reassuringly obvious, but don't worry, it's the joy of studying English rather than, she says with a random prejudice maths, um, <laughs> that there isn't a single correct answer, which if any, any decent mathematician will tell me that once you get into complicated maths, there isn't one clear answer, but English, so much of it is about ambiguity, possibility, um, your personal response to it. So enjoy that. It's your personal response to the passages is what you're finding in them and so on. I think that, um, that's not something schools taught you. That's about you genuinely engaging. Mm. That would be what I said. What yeah, I said. wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Lynn. Yeah, I have very little to add to that. It's great. So thank you very much. Um, I just kind of underlined that the reason we ask you to do yet another test, as if you haven't done already, <laughs> enough already, um, is because the ELAT really is designed to test what we see as the key skills that you're going to need. Um, when you're studying English. We've already talked about the love of reading. Um, so as they mentioned, you know, the, the ability to really want to get into the, the language and, and, and to think about um, what, how it's being used and, and, and how it's making you as a reader respond to that text. What, what is going on here? That ability to want to get into detail is something that we really want to, to see. Yeah. And, and again, that and the ability to organize your thoughts in, in quite a quick amount, you know, quite a brief amount of time. Can you just get this together for 50 minutes? Show us how your thoughts are working. Yes. And, and I completely underline what, what Sol says as well. It's not about sustained brilliance. <laughs> <laughs> as if we could all do that <laughs> yeah um, that. <laughs> yeah that's right <laughs> it is about everything everything that w that this admissions process is about is is you and your potential yes not that you're a finished article that's not what we're we're interested in we're interested in potential because you know when we went through this somebody saw that potential in us and so we want to give that that back and say so we're going to find that potential in other people mm. because we know that if you've got this potential and you come to Oxford to study English you're going to have a great time so that's really what it's about yeah wonderful thank you um I think with with reference to that um Iris Meg and Jennifer what you've just heard from Soss and Lynn how would you I know we talked about this in the previous live stream we talked about the ELAD but how would you respond in giving some advice to, to applicants? How would you, what would you propose they go and do in, in preparation? Um, Iris, let's start with you. I think um, as a student, the way that I always did my, any of my work was doing past papers and that is a really important way to start with everything um, because there are lots online and they give you a really good understanding of what other years have been confronted with to deal with. So um, we had a little group at school, a few of us are applying for English, so we all kind of just did them every week and then we'd come back and discuss them. Um, which is kind of scary because I always hated the ones I'd written and <laughs> I preferred, I like, I like the idea of not doing any work before it, but I honestly think it's really good to get yourself in the mindset of what it looks like. Cause it's not like anything you've done before and it's quite weird. Mm. Um, but also reading around, I think just keep reading and reading stuff that you, that you like and that you're uncomfortable reading, reading different sorts of materials and reading different formats, you know, kind of reading a poem every day. I think Meg was almost another, another Zoom we had, but I was doing that before 
I applied, I have a little book by Ruth Padel, it's like a poem for every day of the year or something and you open it and she has a poem and then she talks about her understanding of the poem, which was really useful for me. Um, reading plays maybe, because you're so familiar with, they have different sorts of material in the ELAT, don't they? So um, yeah, I think practicing, honestly, it might sound scary and you don't want to do it, but it's really, really helpful. Definitely, that's, that's excellent advice. Um, Jen, what would you offer? Yeah, I think it's really important to just catapult yourself out of your literary comfort zone because you never know what's going to come up on the actual day in the ELAT. So um, I know it's been mentioned that you should read as widely as possible, but what I did was I went on Instagram and I found those, you know, poets that make me absolutely nauseous in real life. And I thought there was absolutely no literary value in their work. And I forced myself to find something that I could comment on and something that I thought could be potentially profound and beautiful. So just that experience of reading something that I personally found quite bizarre and unappealing and trying to see it from an alternate point of view, I thought was very helpful. Mm, that really is kind of, as Sos said earlier, steering into the difficulty and yeah, the comfort zone and just really trying to tackle something new. So that sounds actually like a very good way of, of prepping. Nice. Um, and Meg, finally. Um, not to repeat what's been said. So another thing I did was um, just actually talk to any friends that enjoy English as well mm. um, about. So, so find what might be a difficult poem for you for whatever reason and see what they see in it. That, um, so again, that idea of perspective and they might come from a completely different angle and it might help you actually have um, a different methodology of like looking at poems and, or even just like a slant that you'd never thought about and trying to bring that into your own, your own sort of critical gaze. I think that's really helpful. Mm, wonderful, thank you. Um, okay, so moving forwards with the application timeline, there's the request from colleges to submit written work. Um, We'll stay on this quickly because I'm, I'm aware time is moving past. And written work isn't the, the hardest thing. It's not like the ELA, it's not like the interview. Soss and Lynn, what do you want to see in, in written work? We want to see you at your best, I think, yes. Um, and, and we're well aware of what that means. I won't spend a lot of time on this, particularly this, this year. Um, please send us a piece of written work of connected prose about literature that you think you're really proud of, that you, you, you feel that this was really good work. Um, I was really interested in doing this and wanted to write it. Now, we're being, um, again, you know, we're being much broader and saying whatever, <laughs> whatever you have written, and what, whatever uh, you know, a teacher has looked at, hopefully, that's what we'd like to see. Um, it, it could be a close analysis, another close analysis of a, of a poem or a, a, an extract, that's fine. Please, can you tell us what it is? Because <laughs> it is quite hard when we, we just receive that kind of thing and no, we're trying to work out what it is we're reading about. Um, so if you could just kind of add something, say, this is what this is about, um, that's very helpful. So yeah, pick something you've enjoyed writing that you think you're proud of and, and send it to us. It's just another little piece for us to look at um and and put in with everything else so i is that i think that's probably enough so yes i don't know if you've got anything else to say um just to explain that when you submit the piece of written work it comes with a cover sheet where you yeah. say what the task was how long you had to do it in yeah. and what kind of help you had yeah and in that sense some people are submitting pieces of a-level coursework or something they've had like three months and it's in the second or third draft and some people it's something you did overnight before you started working on something or you did it under exam conditions as an unseen or whatever so we're very used to comparing incredibly unlike tasks so don't worry about that at all don't worry about what mark the teacher put on it so if it's something you really liked um and you're but didn't hit whatever AO criteria or something like that, that's fine. It's, it's a taste of how you write. Um, it's more, longer is often more useful than shorter. Yeah. So something done under timed conditions, we've got the ELAP for that. So often if you've had a little more than time conditions to do it in, that's sometimes helpful. But actually at this point, because of COVID and everything else, many people just don't have that. So whatever it is, is useful to us. Just don't stress about it. Um, and if you're anything like me, what Lynn said about something that you're really proud of and really pleased with, I hate everything I've written as soon as I've written it. <laughs> Just loathe it. So fine. It could be something you utterly despise, but just send something. And actually, you may find, looking back on it much later, that it really was quite good. Um, 
so you don't need to feel, I mean, fantastic if you love it and you think I wrote this brilliant essay, that's wonderful. Um, but if you think I wrote this drivel and I'm deeply ashamed of it, but it's the only thing I've got to send in, just send it to us because we may love it. That is completely true, completely possible, yes. Um, just quickly, Jen and Iris, what uh, what sort of work did you submit? Um, no. Um, so I compared uh, 19 East Born Brave New World because I like adore Huck, so I'm doing my diss on him now actually. Um, and what, I, I, what initially struck me, I watched a YouTube video where they were having a debate about it. And then I tried, because it's quite um, uh, already done debate, um, I tried to find nuances. So looking for Christian um, like motifs throughout both of them and comparing them. So yeah, I would just say like, do whatever, you know, really interests you. But if you're, if you are doing something that sort of uh, has been done in some way before try and find like your own little niche um because that that's really interesting and and one other thing I'd say is because they might use it as a prompt in an interview it's all different make sure you continue to think about it after you've written it so you have some other mm. things to say as well not just repeating your essay yeah wonderful thank you uh, Jen what uh, what sort of work did you submit yeah, so I did IB before coming up to Oxford, so I did an extended piece on um, Patrick Suskin's Perfume, which was a piece in translation, which I thought was quite interesting. Um, but looking back at my written work, I actually went back and read it a couple of weeks ago, and it's almost forcibly bad. I, I cringe so hard, I dislocate my neck a little bit every time I hit a new paragraph. It's just, yeah, I'm reiterating what's been said about it's it's not the only element in your interview. So if you feel like it's not your you at your most brilliant and coruscating, then don't spend too much time stressing about it. I think that's that's good advice. And Iris, I was just trying to remember what it was. I think it was um, <laughs> it was an A level essay from a a week's work on desire and streetcar and desire, which is really overdone. If you've done streetcar, everyone will have written an essay on this, and I'm sure it wasn't anything particularly exciting. But um, it was a genuine piece of work that I'd written that week, and maybe I'd thought a bit bit hard about that one knowing I sent it to Oxford um mm. kind of put up maybe some nuances but I don't think it particularly was very nuanced um I remember just thinking that the week after I'd done a better essay than I wish I'd said in this day. oh so, um, always the way it goes always <laughs> the way it goes fair enough well thank you um and then we get to the the big um the big bit of the Oxford mission process which of course is the interview um so before we do start talking about that. I've just noticed um, the question, how many pieces of submitted work may we hand in? Now for English, it's just the one. If you're doing English and a joint school, the requests will vary. So you will need to check the joint school page. Um, I'm aware that for modern languages, it needs to be one piece written in English, one piece written in the target language, and I think another piece written about the target language, but in English. So yeah, you'll, you'll need to go and check those out, but the information is freely available on the Joint School info pages. Um, you can navigate to them in this virtual open days landing page that you're currently in. Um, wonderful. So the big part of Oxford uh, admissions is the interview. Um, Nin and Sars, what, what happens? What do you look for? What goes well? What doesn't go well? Hit us. Um, so Lynn. you go for, oh me first okay oh, if you want to if you want to <laughs> um okay um again although you you kind of brought this in with a bit of a fanfare Alfie and this wow. is the big thing um I think the first thing I'd want to say is it is the last thing it <laughs> it's the last piece in in this jigsaw that that we have been talking about it it helps us see you as a person, yeah, we've, we've got lots of stuff about you on paper, we've written in your ELAT script, we've seen your written work, we've seen your application, this makes it three dimensional, we meet the person. And that to me is the most important thing, yeah. Um, and I think my, I, my response would be, again, that all that what we've been saying all along, we're not looking for a polished performance, we're not looking for you to come in and ace your interview, you know, in a way that <laughs> uh, you think you've just got it down, and you've answered all our questions. Um, you can expect the questions to be probing, you can expect the questions perhaps to take you in unexpected directions. That doesn't mean that you can't have practice beforehand this ideas from Iris, Jen and Meg about, you know, talking with your friends about 
a literature about ideas generally is one of the best ways to prepare for interview mm. get comfortable with the idea of exploring ideas um so we're not looking for a perfect performance um you can expect the people who are interviewing you to be encouraging mm. we you know want you to do well we want to hear from you and we know because we're experienced interviewers that the best way to do that is to put you at your ease as much as we can to be friendly to be we'll be challenging and we'll be you know we'll be asking you to to think but we're not going to be sitting there with poker faces you know <laughs> will respond to you it's a it's a conversation it's not an inquisition I think that's what I would say mm. so I'll introduce that and let kind of Soz take it a little bit further yeah and I'll come back um I'd agree with what Lynn said completely so really importantly exactly what you said about it's about potential not polish if you're a finished product we'd have nothing to do <laughs> so what we're looking for uh, ultimately what we're looking for is in interview, so everything on paper has shown us in effect where candidates are now. It's interview that gives us the clearest indication of where they could get to. Mm -hmm. And that's because in interview, we get a sense of a readiness to think on your own, an ability to think beyond what you thought when you came in the room. Mm -hmm. um, enthusiasm comes through, a readiness to rethink things. Um, so it's not about getting things right in as far as there is a right in English. It's about a readiness to enter into conversation and explore further. Um, I've had candidates occasionally who come in with, you know, their version of what Hamlet's about. And, you, you know, I ask questions and complicate it. And they're just annoyed because, you know, they had Hamlet sorted. They had the answer. It was all tied up with a neat bow. And I've gone and messed with it. And they're just, oh, you know, and, and that's a sign they don't really want to think about it. It's not fun. Whereas the, the, in a sense, if you love talking about the subject, you love that sense of discovery, the way that text can change as you respond to them, mm. then once you get talking about something, then it's kind of exciting if other possibilities open up and so on. So ultimately with the interview, we'll nearly always, at least one of your interviews or half of an interview will start with a bit of close reading. Um, so you'll be sent this year, they're gonna be online which means in advance you're sent an excerpt from something on a poem or whatever, and you've got a bit of time to read it through on your own. And then that's a starting point for the interview. Um, it's, in my experience, it stops you being quite so nervous because you start knowing you've got something to say about that. Um, and it, again, it's often it's a teaching opportunity, that excerpt. So they're often something where a student's got, a candidate's got a certain way, but hasn't got the rest of it. And it's, not about, okay, they got three marks out of six or something like that. It's actually, okay, this is where the conversation starts. So have you thought about this bit? Or that works perfectly for this stanza, but what about how do you think that fits with that? And then mm. seeing how they rethink. So actually it's an exploration together and we try and choose excerpts where we haven't made up our minds on them. So that mm. there are, you, you're kind of rediscovering them each time you're talking to a new candidate. Um, so that's one part of the interview. Another part is, I always think with interviews, we, we start with the familiar and try and take a candidate to the unfamiliar. So again, um, I don't know, say a candidate wants to talk on Hamlet and what we're trying to do is not find out what a candidate doesn't know because every candidate could do that with us. Mm -hmm. Every single person I've ever interviewed will have read stuff I haven't. So they could then spend time asking me difficult questions about it, which I couldn't answer, which would make me look stupid, which would be utterly pointless. <laughs> So that is, that is not what we're doing because that would be completely pointless. What we're doing is trying with each candidate to find what they're interested in, they know about, and then to explore it further. So we're mm. trying to find what they're genuinely engaged with and on their strongest ground with. Mm. And then to ask questions, often if it's, you know, set text and so on, ask a question we know they'll like, you know, streetcar named desire, we might ask about desire. Everybody who studied that text will have thought about it. And then whatever, the kind that comes up with you then ask a question that sort of complicates that or where do you go from that or how do you connect that with this and try and take them onto unfamiliar ground so that we know they're thinking for themselves and mm. thinking there in that moment and in my experience pretty much every candidate sort of by the end of it they've stopped being nervous because they're thinking and if you're thinking and discussing literally love you're you're not performing you mm -hmm. you you forget about yourself um and that so they're relaxed but also their brain hurts like that. <laughs> um, and what we're aiming for I've had this feedback from a huge number of candidates that it interview was one of the first times when they had some they really felt like somebody was interested in what they thought 
Mm. And we genuinely are. So think of it as I've done, I mean, literally probably thousands of interviews now. And every single one is fascinating. Every mm. single one is a conversation I'd have loved to keep going for another hour because there is so much more to discover and talk about and everything else. And every single interview ends with, oh my God, we're behind schedule. I'm so sorry we're going to stop there. <laughs> um, and it's that, it's just a good conversation. It's a good conversation. If you're applying for English, you, there's something you love about studying English. So it's a chance for us to talk with, you know, other people who share our sad and strange love of literature. <laughs> um, and that it's that simple. Mm. I'd say, I, yeah I'd also say yeah, we understand you're nervous mm. yeah and so, so uh, it's really important that we understand that yeah so so it doesn't matter if you're not if you're a bit hesitant at times it doesn't matter if you stop in the middle of a sentence and say you want to rethink and start again actually that's a really good thing <laughs> when yeah. somebody that happens in an interview oh hang on a minute I'm heading down a path I'm not sure where I'm going with this let me just regroup that's fine it's absolutely fine and and I think you must remember that as we've been stressing, an interview is a dialogue. So mm. it's as much about you as the person being interviewed thinking, am I enjoying this? Is this, do I want more of this? Because the other thing that an interview is, is a go at a tutorial. This is what mm. it's going to be like on a weekly basis when you're going to be sitting in a room with a tutor and maybe another student with you talking about what your work talking about what you're thinking and then thinking about where you're going to go next now if you come into an interview and that's great and you're enjoying it then you know oxford is the right place for you um but it's okay for that not to be quite what you want mm. as well I, I i really want to stress that because i think that very often the interview is you know pass or fail it's not not a straight forward as that by any means but it does give you a sense of how you learn. Is mm. this how I'm going to learn? Yeah. Mm. Is, is this what I want? Because it is about that. It's about your choice as well. You've chosen to apply to Oxford. Great. But there are, you know, I want to say that because I think it's really, really important. Yeah. And, yeah. and it's not about passing or failing or you know no, I don't, all these I, kind of metaphors clearing a hurdle or whatever it might be i hate those things mm. <laughs> yes. and I, I think it's especially relevant that it isn't a pass or fail because there is a second round of interviews yeah. and you might be yeah you might think oh the, those really didn't go very well i wasn't yeah. pleased but something was obviously spotted by a tutor and they mm. want you to come back and try again and that's a really nice thing to happen and if it doesn't happen then there's no point reading into it because if, if you read into it you get in your head and everything gets mm. worse and stressed so take it as it comes I think is yeah. the way to look at interviews yeah. um we, we've, we've kind of spoken about what you guys look for I think it's much harder to to talk through the contents of an interview because everyone is 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 different they, yeah. they can't be the same that's just fundamentally how it works so I would like to ask the undergraduates is to cast your minds back to your interviews and the moment you're about to go in the door or log into the Teams call and just just try and recall how you felt there and then also tell us how you felt at the at the end when it was all over, when you got out of that room. I, I'd really like to know, because I think it will help people to understand what to expect, what to, you know emotions they will be feeling. Um, Meg, how did you feel right before and right after your interviews? Um, well, when, when I was going to interviews, I was really, really shy. So I was so nervous because I was like, well, I'm going to have to speak to someone who's like scarily brilliant at literature. And actually the, um, the close reading and stuff that really helped like settle me down. And I remember like I once didn't know the answer to a question and just said I'm really sorry I don't know how to approach that. And they helped me out like that. They're, they're human. They're not going to sort of... You, you know they they want you to succeed because it's you, you've already got this far through the application it's not like they want people to do badly that's not the point of it um so I think I actually came out um of I think my third interview because I got pulled around a bit um and like felt just really excited and I remember telling my parents like oh it's really cool we talked about all these really cool things and so I, I went in feeling like incredibly nervous and sort of shaking and came out just being like that's the best experience I've had so I think and I've heard that from a lot of people as well so it's it just it is okay if you go in feeling feeling scared because most people will I, I haven't met someone who didn't um mm. but they're, they're always they are always less scary than you think I think I think I'd say that yeah I think there's, there's a lot of 
I mean, yeah, as, as Lynn pointed out, I was sort of guilty of bringing it with a fanfare. There is a lot of hype around interviews because alongside Cambridge, we're one of the few universities that still does it. Um, yeah, I think that's that's a really good point to bring up, Meg. Thank you. Um, Iris, how did you feel right before and right after your interviews? Oh, I was, I was so in the dark about what would happen. I was so confused about how it all worked. And I was also, I mean, it's really excited, I think it was kind of a, I didn't know what to expect sort of on the edge of something that could be brilliant it could be awful and I think yeah. I was the first one to go for one of the, the ones not that makes a difference I mean obviously everyone's loves a position they are on the interview queue but I think because no one had you know done the whole thing before me I was I had no idea what to expect or how they behave around me the tutors um but I think because I knew that I knew that I kind of I couldn't do anything more at that point but I kind of went there with this kind of thing well just do your best just do it as as you without overthinking everything and that actually worked out in my favour, I think, because I think if you're open to like you know, new ideas and you're not stuck in your ways, but also you're not afraid to say what you think about things, then you can't really have a, anything except, I mean, it might be a bad conversation, but it'd be an interesting conversation. <laughs> um, I think by the end, I was, I was, I left a bit reading. I was, it was very intense and I kind of wanted some more. It was, it was <laughs> over a bit with a few of them and you stop mid conversation, you kind of feel like there's so much more I didn't say because you can never say everything you want to. And that's a great way to end, I think, because mm. opened up, you've kind of blossomed a bit, even if it felt really scary doing that. Yeah, I think if you're, if you're hungry for more at the end of that interview, then that's a very good indication that you, you've enjoyed it and you will fit into the way we, we like to teach it. Yeah, certainly. Um, Jen, before, after, how did you feel? before I think right before I was about to go into the interview room was one of the most exquisitely painful moments of my life I remember just lurking outside the door I could feel my spine turning into petroleum jelly and I just wanted to go away as far as I could but I walked in and I think it's all about realizing you know there's they don't want you to fail any more than you want you to fail like mm. they don't have some kind of faculty wide betting pool on who can make a student cry first they genuinely enjoy a good conversation as much as you're hoping one will happen so I think just realizing that I'm actually in a room talking to um, you know two of the most brilliant people in a field that I adore one of the most beautiful and prestigious institutions in the world so I've just been really lucky to be in that position at all so that helped me see it more as an opportunity to rant about the things I was passionate about rather than in oral interrogation yeah and I definitely left um dizzy with having learned so much feeling like I've been punched in the face a little bit but in a good way like in an intellectually <laughs> stimulating way and I think it was uh, good experience overall. one that I've never heard an interview experience described as being punched in the face in a good way but I I sort of understand where you're coming from I do that's brilliant thank you so much um that is about all we've got time for um in this stream that's uh, sauce would you like to add something I just to add what Lynn said, it's just an interview. Everybody's nervous. Like I said, I've done thousands of interviews. I have never met a candidate who wasn't nervous. That's right. um, you know, it's just, but also it manifests in really different ways. And also every, everybody speaks in different ways. So some mm. candidates, um, I'm a gabbler. So I, if I'm, especially if I'm nervous, I'll just talk and talk and talk. And I'll think, do I think that? No. Oh, hold on. How about this? Other people stop and think. They can go silent. I've, I've had brilliant students who are, they'll be silent for like 30 seconds or so, a minute, it feels like forever. And then they'll come out with what they think. Um, it doesn't matter how you speak, how you respond to it. it. It's take time to think and genuinely answer the question. So what Iris said about sort of going in thinking there's nothing more I could do or whatever. Actually, I think it is, that's really valuable because Candidates who come in and deliver a kind of pre-prepared speech on something mm. doesn't tell us anything and it uses up lots of time. Whereas genuinely go in and just respond to what somebody asks you in, as in a normal conversation. Yeah. And then it goes from there. So I think it's that thing about, you know, all the cliches about be you because everybody else is taken. Um, th there's a sense in actually trying to do an interview pretending to be anybody else would be excruciating <laughs> um, and exhausting. So genuinely it's our job to draw out the best in every candidate, mm. um, to try and set them at ease, to find out what they love, what they know, and to mm. go from there. So you don't have to go into the room preparing to do that. Just respond to what, how the conversation starts. It's that genuinely yeah. that simple. Precisely. Thank you so much. Um, if there's any, anybody would like to add any final comments? No? Wonderful. Well, I think all that remains to say then is 
uh, thank you for, for tuning in everybody and very best of luck in the coming application process. We hope to see your applications and we hope to see you for an interview. Um, uh, and my thanks again to Iris, Meg, Jen and Soss and Lynn for very informative, very uh, useful chat here. And I hope it uh, has given everybody watching some reassurance that we're not some monolith we are normal people who just really like books <laughs> and talking about them <laughs> and talking about books definitely yes. definitely well thank you very much and uh, tune back in in 10 or so minutes for dr ayush lakizani's lecture on medieval arabic and english religious literatures wow yeah it's gonna be a fun one <laughs> sounds great <laughs> yeah. okay.